Hello everybody, we are live. Good afternoon and welcome to our inaugural Tor Beam Climate Action Investment Summit. My name is Elise Lingaridis. I am the co-organizer and host of the summit today. We are delighted that you are joining us today in this venture on what seems to be today a sunny day in Germany and in most of Europe. Thank you also to those joining from other parts of the world to start the event chat by telling us where you're joining from today and what you are most excited to see. We have seen registrations as far as Thailand or Myanmar, so if you are from there, please say hi. With the sudden onset of the pandemic, we have had to adapt our plans, decisions and future commitments. With our Berlin flagship event on a break, we are looking in ways to continue the work which TOR has been doing over the past eight years, which is to make us future-proof and create spaces for meaningful exchange and collaboration. I'll bite new for us step by step with our new initiatives like Beam, Club and Meet. We are getting there. We're super happy that you have chosen to be part of our journey of new online experimentation. The summit will last around two hours and 15 minutes with a 15 minute break in between. And you may review the agenda at any time by going to the reception and scrolling down. We have seven company presentations today and one fireside chat. All the companies are different sizes, backgrounds and ideas, but are tied together by the same cause the vision of a sustainable globe, free of fossil fuels and carbon emissions. As mentioned above, we're delighted to have people joining from different backgrounds and several parts of the world. We're all the more happy for you to chat with each other in private if you wish. In the People tab, you may see the names and bios of attendees, should you wish to chat that way. Please refrain from any inappropriate behaviour, both in the event chat and privately and be kind to one another. If you happen to receive something that didn't look right, feel free to report this to us after the event. Of course, at this point, I would like to thank everyone who has collaborated on this project and made it happen. Primarily to our nine wonderful speakers who have accepted our invitation despite their very busy schedules. Then to all the Tora Beam team who with their cooperation and support have made this possible. So now I'd like to invite Benjamin Schultz on the stage to give us a brief introduction on the summit and the idea behind it. Welcome, Benny. Is Benny there? Yes. He is. Thanks. Hi, Benny. How are you? Great. It's working. Great. All our <laughs> tech infrastructure is holding up. Exactly. So... First of all, thanks a lot to you and Tor for organizing all this. Um, we were witness of this. Can hear you? Oh, that is unfortunate. Do you hear me now? After all the prepping, you don't hear me? Elise, anybody can give me a hint in the chat if you hear me. Otherwise, I'm going to just keep talking. So thanks a lot, Elise, for organizing this. As you might know, the BEAM is about the United People of Climate Action. It's about meaningful initiatives to reduce the carbon footprint, uh, footprint of society and, of course, uh, all the parts that belong to it. I just had a quick look at what is the current CO2 level in the atmosphere right now in April of 2020 or May. And it is the highest CO2 level it has in modern history. It's 418 ppm. That's uh, usually what is uh, regarded a safe CO2 level to keep the climate as it is uh, on the globe is 350 ppm. So we are about between 15 to 25 percent above this level already. And although now with COVID, the output of CO2 has been a little bit slower than expected, it's still going to rise this year and the next uh, uh, years in the foreseeable future. So the problem is as immediate as ever. What to do and thank all.
would like to ask everybody to give us feedback on this particular format because we plan to do it more often and keep improving on it. And I'd now like to basically hand the microphone back to Elise to guide you through the summit. Um, there is a lot more to explore and we are very happy we made this happen. The first idea Tour Beam Summit is here, and we make this something that's regular and that inspires a lot of investors um, and companies, and of course, the broader public um, to get active and make meaningful um, initiatives. So, thanks a lot to everyone. Benny, thank you so much for that introduction. We really, really appreciate it. Um, so without um, further ado, we are now ready to enter the first block of startup presentations. And Benny, you may leave the stage if you wish. Thank you. The first company has been posing some questions that have really been hitting us hard. How sustainable is our money? While most of us are making an effort to play a role in a sustainable future, what we are not realizing is that the money in our savings accounts might be financing industries which are slowing those efforts, such as the arm industry or fossil fuels. But there is a bank that is seeking to resolve that problem. Tomorrow Bank are pledging that our deposits will be eco-friendly. In other words, not a single of our pennies will be used to make those industries thrive. Tomorrow Bank's 30k plus users have already deposited over 30 million euros, while nearly a third of that money has gone directly into sustainable investment. So how do we want to live tomorrow? We are super happy today for our first Tour Beam speaker, Tomorrow Bank's co-founder, Michael Schweikart. Welcome, Michael. Is Michael there? Awesome, he's here. Hi, Michael, how are you? Hi, Elise, thank you. Thank you for the warm welcome and thank you for inviting me. Thank you for joining. We're really excited to see what you have today for us. Yes, Just let me see how I can share. We'll wait for you to share your screen and we'll let you go. Fantastic. Okay, somehow it's only sharing my screen and not my PDF. Just a second. PDF now, is there. I think, can you now see my presentation? See your presentation perfectly, thank you. All right, perfect. Great, you may now begin and I will see you in eight minutes. Thank you very much. Yeah, first of all, I'm happy that all the technical stuff worked and I'm happy to be here. Uh, can neither show the nice garden that Benny or uh, just did or, and neither the hair, but I try my best uh, to, to present tomorrow today. So um, we, we did look at um, how the world looked like and what, what role money was playing there. And we thought that money kind of moves the world, but it's really moving into the wrong direction. And, this is, um, uh, this is only one example that I'm not now going to show you. So 33 banks actually funneled 1.9 trillion US dollars into fossil fuels since 2016, since the Paris Agreement, actually. And um, it, it doesn't stop there. So if you look at uh, the other banks, um, or if you look at, at what banks are doing, um, there's a scandal almost every week, and, and you can count on Deutsche Bank being, uh, being part of the scandal usually. Um, however, I mean, most of the other banks don't lag that far behind. Um, and fortunately, there are also there are already new digital challenger banks coming up, attacking those incumbents, uh, mainly on the UX side, and they're also very successful there. However, we thought um, it's, uh, it's, really, it's not enough, so we thought the bank of the future, the bank of tomorrow, would have to be more. This is why we started tomorrow. And we wanted to build it on three pillars mainly. We wanted to be 
tech driven. We wanted it to be truly sustainable and we wanted it to be collaborative. So what does that mean? First of all, we believe that uh, to save the world, you have to throw a better party than the ones destroying that, destroying it. And that means we also really have to build a great product. From the UX side, we're already there, I would say. From the feature list, we'll be there by the end of this year. More importantly, tomorrow is truly sustainable. And that means we build the, um, the aspect of sustainability into every element of our business model. So starting with the customer deposits, which is like the core element of every bank, and we work with our customer deposits as well as um, all the other banks. However, we don't invest into weapons or the oil industry or any other destructive industries, but instead shift the money towards organic farming, renewable energies and other industries that have a really positive impact on the sustainable development goals. We also right now um, uh, developing our tomorrow fund where you can invest into the 100 most sustainable companies worldwide and we'll be launching it soon. As a third element, we're also really focusing on enabling a sustainable lifestyle. So every time you pay with a tomorrow card, um, we take the interchange fee and put that into a climate protection project. So every time you pay, you save a few square meters of rainforest. We also um, uh, offer features such as CO2 offsetting and we'll be, uh, we'll be launching many more features in, in, that, in that area. The third element of tomorrow, collaboration, is also quite important to us. So um, we want to do it differently. We really want to be transparent. And this is why we show in our impact board in real time as the first banking uh, um, uh, company ever, how many customers we have, how many customer deposits we have, where their money is invested right in this minute and what positive impact it is creating. We're also really community driven. Uh, we really try to uh, have an open conversation with our customers, with our community. We try to integrate them in our next features in how we want to shape tomorrow as a company and how we want to shape tomorrow um, uh, yeah, for all of us. And uh, it's also quite important to base all of this on values and really to, to um, engrave those values into the company. And this is why we're right now uh, becoming a certified B Corp corporation. We already started. Uh, we opened um, uh, tomorrow for everyone approximately one year ago. So in March 2019, um, everybody in Germany who wanted to could open a tomorrow account. And since then, we've created quite some buzz. Most of the newspapers or uh, news formats really liked uh, the new idea of rethinking banking and uh, uh, did quite a few interesting uh, articles about, about that idea. And we've also been gaining customers since then. Uh, starting approximately one year ago, we now reached uh, 31,000 customers as of today, as you can also check um, in the app, in the impact board. And we are really trying to be a little bit different here than the incumbents. And we're really also a little bit proud that we are different. And you can see that also in the numbers. First of all, we really focus on customer support. We believe it's important that um, we are there for our customers. It's not only a cost center for us. Um, we really want to help our customers with the issues they have. And fortunately, that shows also in, in customer satisfaction. People also really trust us with their money. And that comes as a surprise because we're still a young bank. We're still a challenger bank. Um, but when you look at us compared to the rest of the challenger banks, looking at N26, for example, with 84 euros as an average customer deposit and looking at tomorrow with 1,208 euros as an average deposit, you see there's a factor of 14 uh, in between that. So this is, this is what it means uh, doing things differently. Um, and what we also try to focus on is really talking about how we want to build a better tomorrow for all of us, doing that through social media, um, doing that uh, through uh, connecting with our community. And this is also why um, our numbers there are completely different than all the other banking companies out there. 
So with us, uh, 95%, now with us, we have almost as many social media followers as we have banking customers. And the biggest difference is in the footprint. So as of today, in June 2020, an average Tomorrow customer saves one ton CO2 per year simply by being a Tomorrow customer. And how do we do that? So first of all, we do that with uh, the Tomorrow debit card. I mentioned it before. Um, we, with every uh, payment um, we do, we take the interchange fee and put that into a climate protection project. On top of that, we invest our customer deposits into um, sustainable projects such as renewable energy and organic farming. And the third element um, is uh, Tomorrow Zero. It's already at 34%. So we launched the first current account ever to be completely CO2 neutral. So with signing up for a premium account Tomorrow Zero, you offset um, the whole carbon footprint of an average German per year. And we do not want to stop there. We really want to have impact and to have real impact, we also need to be big. And being big usually means um, becoming a unicorn. This is kind of the status of today. However, we do not want to become a unicorn. We want to be a zebra. What, what does that mean? There was a critical article on Medium saying, hey, there needs to be a sustainable, more sustainable alternative to the unicorn, and that is the zebra. What is the difference? Zebras are black and white. They are not purely profit driven, but they are also out for the common good. Zebras are also real. They solve real world problems. With tomorrow, we try to help solve climate change. Tom uh, zebras are also herd animals. They work together, they collaborate, they collaborate, they try to help each other. And most importantly, they are not tameable. They have their values and they will stick to those values. And this is why we truly believe that uh, zebras will be the unicorns of tomorrow. Thank you. Hello. Hi, Michael. That was amazing. Thank you so much for that. Thank you for having me. No problem at all. We can see um, a lot of questions arising in the event chat. So you may leave the backstage and join uh, the conversation. Um, but thank you so much for that. Cool. Fantastic. So that's our first presentation. There are some really interesting facts. So next up, um, we have a speaker who is a climate all-rounder, being involved in many great initiatives involving climate action. Apart from being the founder and CEO of Plan A, a company providing a digital platform for companies to monitor their carbon footprint, she's also one of the founders of Green Tech Alliance, an alliance of green tech companies, advisors such as journalists or VCs, community catalysts and academic institutions. With the onset of COVID-19, Lubomila and her team are even more motivated to make the alliance's efforts stronger and fight climate change. Here to talk to us about her two initiatives, both of which she has founded, is Lubomila Jordanova. Welcome, Lubomila. Hi, Anne. Hi, Lubomila. How are you? I'm good, thank you. First day in the office, really exciting. <laughs> oh, fantastic. Looking great today. Um, we're really excited for your presentation. So if you may share your screen with us, that would be great. Absolutely. Uh, perfect. So you can see my screen, right? Lovely. We can see your screen. I will leave the stage and come back in eight minutes. Wonderful. Thank you so much for having me uh, to the TOA team and the BEAM. Um, today I'm going to tell you a bit about Plan A, but also about the Green Tech Alliance. Uh, First about Plan A and actually what has given us uh, the authority and capacity to build the Green Tech Alliance. Um, I started the company uh, three years ago, and the vision and mission has always been to use data to enable people and companies to act on the climate change crisis. Uh, what has been achieved so far within uh, this short amount of time is that we've been able to analyze over 300,000 data points, uh, which are now incorporated in our two products. We also have a community of over 100,000 people, and we've served the needs of over 
uh, 200 companies. Let's talk a bit about the tech. Uh, so the first side of our product is our algorithm. Uh, it's a predictive algorithm that uses over 300,000 data points to help decision makers understand how their supply chain and access to natural resources is going to be affected thanks to climate change. The second is our software, which through predictive methodology is able to help companies reduce significantly their footprint and automate sustainability action planning so that incorporating sustainability metrics is something that is really straightforward. The software focuses on uh, three pillars. It's essentially a journey for different companies for one year at least, where they have to go through certain uh, stages and steps in order to be able to develop an understanding of their sustainability and also the actions that they can take in order to reduce their scope one, two and three emissions. Um, for this, we have worked with a few hundred companies and we have been able to look not only at Germany as a market, but also Finland, uh, France, UK, and now by the end of June, we will be expanding across the EU. The features of the platform include monthly carbon footprint tracking, which is um, a necessary step before we are capable of understanding how to advise a company on addressing their sustainability needs most effectively. The sustainability action plans are fully automated and they are put together based on the ambitions that the company has um, and can secure a 50% reduction uh, within the span of one year. The monthly carbon offsetting is done through certified projects that we handpick based on the impact for our planet. We focus on community-based projects because we know that there's a lot of challenges that uh, have to be addressed simultaneously as the company reduces its own carbon footprint. The algorithm has been our work for uh, a long time and it's our opportunity to connect to the wealth of data that is out there um, related not only to agriculture but also uh, to emission levels, natural disasters, and then be able to kind of empower companies to understand what's happening on a country level and what's happening on an industry level and how different industries will be impacted in the longer term uh, within 20 to 30 years uh, based on how our planet and its climate is changing. For this, of course, we haven't been relying only on our own capabilities. We have established a significant amount of partnerships to be able to tap into the existing data sources and essentially connect to all these players that have been understanding different aspects of the challenges to our planet for a long time. Um, this could be an example of the red list of uh, threatened species. It could be um, the climate change performance index. It could be the World Resource Institute with its wealth of data and uh, putting all these metrics and understanding all these data sets together we're then able to provide tailored perspectives on where the company is moving forward um, and how it should adapt itself to make its sustainability uh, agenda more prominent and its supply chain more green. But uh, I would like to follow up also with regards to, uh, you know, what has been at the core of what we're building. Plan A has been since day one reliant on data. Data is something that we trust in because there's been a lot of knowledge and um, research put into actually putting something together that is incredibly reliable. And connecting all these data points allows us to essentially uh, enable a company to be more powerful and more uh, capable of adapting itself to the sustainability challenges ahead. We also have built a lot of calculators. Our focus, uh, having access to this data is also to be able to make it useful for decision makers. Um, we've collected uh, and connected with a lot of scientists that have been helping us with understanding where we're standing with the choices that we make in terms of defining our product's vision. Um, and finally, we have a large network. Uh, we have been uh, recognized uh, across different uh, competitions around the world, as well as uh, across a lot of uh, different uh, media. And this has been for the fact that for us, mission has always been before profit. Planet is at the core of why we started this company and it has become visible also to the people making decisions 
around what uh, they want to support in terms of visibility, which we're incredibly grateful for. So uh, this is a bit about Plan A. Uh, Plan A has also been uh, the reason and uh, I would say the instigator behind uh, the Green Tech Alliance. Uh, what is the Green Tech Alliance? So uh, seven weeks ago, together with five other co-founders, we sat down and we found out that a lot were challenged by COVID in terms of access to revenue, but also a lot were challenged by access to stakeholders in the longer vision, longer term vision that they had for themselves. And this was not true only for the co-founders, but also to a lot of other green tech founders that we had access to in our network. So within seven weeks, which is not a short amount of time, uh, actually within uh, four weeks uh, since we actually launched, uh, we have been able to put together over 200 startups, 150 advisors, uh, and then community catalysts such as Climate Kick, uh, Yale, Open Lab, uh, and many others. Um, these are the six of us behind the initiative. Uh, me, uh, Simon from Green Tech, uh, Green City Solutions, uh, JJ from Plan A, Hannah from Sylphia, Andrew uh, from Vunatry, and Emma from Ecoligo. Um, and our uh, vision is, and these are the criteria that different founders have to follow in order to be able to get uh, in the alliance. Uh, your company has to be focused on improving the health of our planet, to building new processes or replacing products or materials. Also, there should be a commitment to a balance between planet profit and people, as well as awareness to greenwashing um, and clear understanding uh, of how uh, we are uh, committing to help the planet. We have uh, managed to get a lot done within a short amount of time. Um, I invite you all to join us at our launch event on the 10th of June. Uh, well, we're going to talk a bit more with these prominent and wonderful people uh, about where the Green Tech Alliance is headed. Thank you so much, and I look forward to hearing more from the other speakers. Hi. <laughs> Lubomila's gone, but that's fine. Thank you so much, Lubomila, for that. Um, we really appreciate it. Um, you may return to the event chat to answer any questions if you wish, or you can also chat privately in the People tab. Next up, uh, we are empowering the electric revolution. The Swedish company Blixt, with an exclamation mark, are seeking to disrupt the 150-year-old electric industry through the introduction of miniature digital circuit breakers. As opposed to normal mechanical breakers, the digital breaker enables remote control, monitoring and full automation of household electricity. In return, this improved monitoring contributes to a better and more efficient use of our electricity grids. Bottom line, Blixt with their Blixt Breaker are helping users adapt their usage in a more sustainable way. Recently, having been granted 1.1 million by the Swedish Energy Agency, with backing from Baywer Ventures, and having entered the 50 to watch list by the Cleantech Group, Blix is certain to pave the way to inspirational changes in the energy industry. Here to talk about it is serial entrepreneur and Blix co-founder and chairwoman, Charlotte Holmquist, who we are really excited to have with today. Welcome, Charlotte. Can you hear us? Hello there. Yeah, hello. How are you? Thank you. Good, good, good. Really many thanks for being here today. We're really excited um, about your presentation. So you may share your screen if you wish. Sure. Great so, stuff. Thank you very much. Thank you. So my name is Carlotta Hornquist and I'm the co-founder of Lix from Sweden, as you said. And our company was founded in 2018 with a quite ambitious goal to develop the market's first solid state circuit breaker. So basically replacing all the mechanics you have in your fuse box with a pure electronic device. And you might ask, why would we do that? Well, according to the World Economic Forum, the biggest threat for a future energy market is the current structure of the electricity system. It was designed to handle central production and a very predictive consumption. 
But as you know, that's not the case today. We have many volatile distributed energy resources and the consumption is also increasingly volatile, such as when thousands of people car charge their cars at the same time. And the problem will not be less in the future as we consume more and more energy. And the short term solution to this is to invest billions and billions of euros in trying to upgrade the current grid and maybe impose heavy penalties on peak hour consumption. And why don't we instead use the power of software and digitization to implement large scale demand response programs at the grid edge? The problem to that is that the energy service provider's endpoint is the meter, and inside the home, we have a fuse box controlling the electricity flow with mechanical circuit breakers. So for the first time, we have replaced the mechanics with pure electronics, and there are many benefits. First, we increase the safety by breaking at least 1,000 times quicker. But also, we can collect sub-metering data to monitor every single load in real time. And thirdly, we can act on the data remotely, not only on off, but digitally from zero to 100%. And that's not all. We also saw a need for a new power inverter with more and more DC sources, such as the rooftop solar and DC loads, such as the EV cars. There is a need for constant conversion between AC and DC. And in fact, half of the investment cost in a rooftop solar installation is the inverters, and they suffer from a range of issues. Most critically is the poor efficiency of peak, lack of grid forming capabilities, and short lifetime due to the mechanics wear and tear that also create arcs. So therefore, we innovated the Xverter, which is a fundamentally different technology for voltage conversion. Through software programming, the user can decide any AC or DC in or output, and it achieves near maximum efficiency, which brings huge benefits over the traditional inverters. Also, we needed to enable easy use and installation. So we combine those two products in a new smart panel. It has built-in home energy management system and cloud connectivity. And unlike any other smart panel, we don't patch together century old technology in a nice shiny box. We have innovated from scratch. And our solution benefits both the energy service providers, our direct B2B customers and the homeowners who are the end users in the value chain. And for the utilities, we offer them a universal retrofit to implement the large scale demand response program. But it's almost like we're introducing a computer and you can run so many applications and use cases on top of that. And the utilities, they're interested for several of them to improve the performance of rooftop solar installation, control and monitoring of direct electricity for heating, a market with 40 million homes only in France, monitoring and controlling of elite cars to balance the peak loads, and not the least for the safety aspect. The main reason for fires in UK homes is because of slow or faulty circuit breakers. To validate the potential carbon savings, we asked Swedish Environmental Research Institute for an impact study and was supported by some leading European utilities as reference group. And this study also resulted in a research article stating that we, our technology could save up to 22% of carbon emissions of electricity used in the, in the residential sector a massive 24 megaton only in four countries. And we start with the residential sector, but circuit breakers and inverters are everywhere. So this is just the beginning. We currently hold 25 patent applications to our core technology, and that can be used for creating new circuit breakers and inverters in all areas, high low voltage, residential, industrial, ACDC, and so on and so forth. And we chose to start with the residential 69 breaker, smart panel, and the exverter, but many more are in pipeline. And all our products can be converted into a low cost silicon chip, offering rapid scale up. So, our end goal is to offer multiple chip families across industries and implementation areas. You can imagine us just like Intel inside. We are addressing very large and fast growing billion euro markets and we will significantly disrupt those markets. Also, the novelty of our technology means we are facing several barriers. 
including access to funding and scaling up. Myself and my co-founders, Jan, Jens and Truett, we have decades of experience from digitization, big data AI, power electronics, and not the least entrepreneurship. I've been an entrepreneur for 20 years, and I was also awarded as Female Entrepreneur of the Year from Metrics last year. Actually, our team got full 100 out of 100 in management scoring. So my point on the current investment landscape, also looking post-corona, is that very few VCs, unfortunately, are willing to invest in hardcore research and development. To put it this way, we've seen it easier to get funding if you package existing technologies in a nice shiny box, but that will not change the future or drive the energy market to the next evolution. So our funding strategy has been to invest all we have in the project at early stage, we also managed to get a corporate venture capital investor on board early. That's difficult for most pre-revenue startups, especially in hardware. In parallel, we have been applying for grants both domestically and from the EU. Uh, as you mentioned, we were recently awarded 1.1 million from the Swedish Energy Agency, and we keep our fingers crossed for the Horizon Green Deal proposal we just sent in. And interesting because those grants usually provide a thorough due diligence, which should be very valuable for other institutional investors to tag along. So post Corona to really build up a sustainable society, I would like to see a closer collaboration between the VCs, climate action investors and the governmental bodies. It's really a win-win situation. And finally, I would like to really really thank all supporters that made it possible for us to get this far our lead investor from bivaria energy ventures the recognition from winning at the set awards the clean tech group and of course the swedish energy agency and all others so if you're looking for either partnerships or participating in our ongoing fundraising more than welcome to contact me at carlotta at blix.tech thank you Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Carlotta. Thank you. It's really, really interesting. And you may go back to the event if you wish to answer any questions for any on the attendees. Um, so thank you very much for that. Thank you. See you at dinner, Daria. Thank you. Bye. 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 Well, thank you very much, Carlotta. Um, and she made us a very good introduction to our next topic, which is also a fireside chat. It's a topic of climate action investment. Less than a week ago, the EU pledged that 25% of the 750 billion to help the bloc recover from the corona crisis will be shared, um, will be set aside for green and digital transitions. There comes a clear statement from this. The EU wants the economy to recover, but with a certain direction, the green direction. So what will the rest of us do? Investors, startups, entrepreneurs are all seeking the answer to that question. What will happen next in the climate action investment landscape? How are VC firms readapting their strategies going forward? What does climate action look like from a VC perspective? We've already seen Laura. <laughs> That's not a problem at all. But we have um, together with us today, Laura McDermott, who is the editorial organizer of The Beam and Fabian Heilemann, um, partner at Early Bird. So we can have them in now to have a lovely fireside chat. Guys, we're waiting for you. Welcome. Fabian. Laura, hello. hello, we're getting there. Thank you so much for your patience. How are you? Very good. good. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much for making time for us, um, both of you. Um, I will leave the stage, um, let you have your fireside and see you in around um, 20 minutes. Perfect. Bye. Bye. Hello, Fabian. How are you? Hi, Laura. Good, thanks. I'm in little phone booth here in our early bird berlin office oh it sounds pretty cush <laughs> um so the first question that i wanted to ask you was um you started your very first business selling french pastries in high school with your brother um and it would be great if you could just tell us a bit about your journey from that point till now 
Paul, I mean, we have only 20 minutes, but <laughs> um, you know, my brother and I grew up in a small city, like country boys in the middle of Germany, but we've been, I would say, kind of self-starter um, entrepreneurs from our teenage years, as you uh, as you just mentioned. Mm -hmm. uh, and that first kind of non-tech business uh, funded us through business school and, uh, and law school. And I was fortunate to spend time early on in Silicon Valley as a visiting student in Santa Clara. Yeah. Stanford were my entrepreneurial interest intersected for the first time with the technology industry. And from age 22 or so, it was clear to me, I want to become what I call in the, in the days an internet entrepreneur. Mm -hmm. And so ever since, my brother and I started um, five companies ourselves, the latest of which is Forto, uh, European leading uh, freight, digital freight for water and supply chain uh, management software company headquartered here in Berlin, 250 mm -hmm. people, probably 80, 90 million in, in revenues uh, this year. Um, and uh, the last company that we still operationally ran together, that was the B2C couponing marketplace called Daily Deal, whose co-founder CEO I was up until uh, we sold it to Google mm -hmm. in late 2011. And thereafter, my brother remained on that co-founder CEO side of the table, but I switched sides and started my career as an angel investor, then stepped up into seed stage investing after two years and after two more years into early stage. And so after um, basically, you know, having learned the, the craft of uh, venture capital investing, um, really bottom up uh, with the sleeves rolled up and small tickets. Mm -hmm. I'm now um, for since five years, a general partner um, at Early Bird, and we manage about 1.5 billion euros in mostly institutional assets that we invest um, in early stage companies all over Europe. Mm. It sounds like quite a journey. Yeah, no, but it's lifelong learning. <laughs> I yeah, can tell you so. <laughs> yeah. um, so my next question, from your personal experience, where do you see climate action investment as being at during this moment in time? And what sort of ideas and startups projects would you, projects would you say are gaining the most traction? Yeah, so I mean... It, it, the sector, the climate tech, or in, you know, in the 2000 years it was called clean tech or green tech, um, it has come a long way. And while many um, private and also institutional investors have lost a lot of money in the 2000 years, um, this is something we have to overcome. So many of the, let's say, veterans in the industry are still somewhat reluctant of touching up on this um, sector in general, um, having basically these memories still. However, a younger generation of investors um, is coming without that legacy and mm -hmm. is looking um, uh, basically increasingly um, at the climate tax base in a broader sense um, with the mindset um, of a financial investor that has in mind the impact of um, the investments uh, she or he is doing. And I think that's really the good news. So. Um, we are arguing a lot also, especially with the veterans in our industry, about what we call the power of and. So about the intersection that's now basically, um, the, the, the lines are now crossing for the first time, which they did not in the 2000 years because the businesses, especially in renewable energies back in the do those days, they had no fundamental right of existence. Those businesses were not um, economically viable. They were only working with subsidies and government but mm -hmm. nowadays this is different and this is really the message we have to convey so nowadays it's not charity versus financially driven investing but there is this intersection of making financially attractive investments that mm -hmm. at the same time have a positive social and or environmental um, impact in a number of um, different industries um, and technology focus areas mm -hmm. and um, i think the the fact that also um, um, gorillas like BlackRock, for example, are sending clear messages in public markets, but also in, um, in private markets, that they want companies and CEOs to actually take action and not just have a paper or a, a, you know an agenda somewhere um, uh, in order to greenwash themselves. Yeah. Which they did for the past couple of years. I think these are all signs um, uh, that the mass market um, on the institutional side, but I think also on the retail investor side, green bonds, etc., is now starting to wake up to this topic. And um, and I think um, the European ecosystem compared to the US 
However, mm -hmm. it's still lagging behind. Yeah. So when you look at the um, the amount of expertise and also specialized climate tech funds, uh, that is still very much um, um, a blank sheet of paper in in Europe with the first players emerging, but still having like little track record. Whereas in the US, there are many examples um, of very um, accomplished funds that have shown very um, a nice financial returns already over the past decade. I think that's something we um, we can learn from when building the climate tech investing ecosystem uh, over here uh, in the EU. Well, there's a lot of um, engineering talent and also European technology, for example, in wind and solar power, especially also from Germany, has been globally leading for a long time. Yeah, yeah. That's, um, that leads nicely into my next question, um, which is focused on the future. Um, so I think you have touched on that slightly, but um, where do you see climate action investment going in the future? And do you think your answer would have been the same three months ago or have these strange and unprecedented times that we're living in altered your perspective at all? So <clears throat> from, from a high level, um, it has not altered my perspective. Okay. And um, obviously, I mean, like tactically or uh, short, short to midterm, the corona pandemic has made headlines and has basically pushed the climate crisis away um, from, say, the number one most systemically relevant um, a topic um, in, in, um, in, 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 in people's minds. Mm -hmm. uh, but um, given um, um, the uh, basically the way the world is managing um, the corona crisis and that uh, having a vaccine is only a matter of time and taking precautionary you know measures learning from asian countries etc that is something that's i think much easier to manage mm -hmm. for a big picture speaking than the climate crisis and yeah. uh, it's just a matter of time of months or worst case quarters um until the climate crisis will basically regain traction and, uh, and, and will be top of the list again, because yeah. from my perspective, there's no way around. And it's evident to me, at least with all data and all um, basically uh, education um, I've, um, I've, I've done for myself on the topic. For me, it's evident that the climate crisis is and remains, despite Corona or other pandemics, the number one challenge for humanity mm -hmm. to solve in the 21st century. And for me, it's also the backbone problem, if you will. So when you think of uh, Humboldt's um, um, a notion of everything connects, yeah. Uh, if there's looking at the top ten challenges that humanity faces in this century, then clearly climate change is the one that is interconnected and intertwined with yeah. the largest number of other challenges. So this is really the backbone issue we need to solve, and mm -hmm. uh, and it will take decades of uh, of effort. Yeah. Yeah, that's really interesting. I completely agree. Um, can we please hear a little about the um, the climate clause that Early Bird has initiated with um, leaders for climate action? I think it happened in January. Yeah, no, sure. I mean, generally, I think, you know, when you when we think of solving climate crisis very high level, um, it needs a tremendous change in behavior, consumer behavior, corporate behavior. Um, it needs technology and innovation, um, and it needs a regulatory environment to encourage, mm -hmm. but also where encouragement doesn't help to force to mm -hmm. some extent, yeah, because we're running out of time. Yeah. We cannot wait for everybody to wake up um, by means of, you know, education and, and, and realizing. Yeah. And um, essentially, um, for, you know, my brother, myself and our climate action friends at Leaders for Climate Action, our um, our climate charity that we co-founded a year ago. Um, it's always about first walking the talk and, and basically showcasing what we are willing to change in our private lives as a consumer in our businesses, how we change travel policy, catering policy, energy providers, and so on and so forth um, in our businesses ourselves. But then um, it was all about um, um, basically contemplating how can we find the biggest possible leverage to make the biggest possible contribution. And for example, now looking at Early Bird or at Forto, we're talking, Early Bird is a team of 45 people all mm -hmm. over Europe. Yeah? And we're talking a couple of hundred tons 
which we um, of, of carbon emissions a year, but we've been reducing 5% last year, and we're aiming at another 10, 15% this year um, by um, employing several of the measures I've just um, uh, I've, uh, I've, I've just uh, um, mentioned. Mm -hmm. But that's a comparatively small amount. When you think of not those 50 people, but those 15,000 people that are uh, on the teams of our portfolio companies, or our 60 portfolio companies, yeah. that is a much bigger lever that we can take. So yeah. what we said jointly with Leaders for Climate Action is, why don't we multiply um, this idea of measuring, reducing, and then offsetting the residual mm -hmm. um, of the carbon footprint on an annual basis so measure reduce offset and repeat why don't we multiply this this idea this concept into our portfolio companies mm -hmm. and so we did and that was the birth place of the term sheet but also shareholder agreement climate clauses that that commits and legally binding and enforced through the board mm -hmm. of those companies where we as a lead or co-lead and vc investor always represented on the board yeah. Um, it enforces the same logic in different steps, uh, um, which are different, um, um, which have a different challenge, basically, to the behavioral and policy change in those companies. But at least the level one, so the entry level, if you will, that is what we ask mandatory from all existing portfolio companies, but also from all new investments. And we are actually happy to witness that with most uh, founders and CEOs out there, they are actually fairly open uh, to adopting that. Mm -hmm. uh, because many of them have the general um, notion um, or problem awareness already. They just did not know what to do, really. And we are just helping them by providing these frameworks and providing the expert guidance from Leaders for Climate Action at no cost, zero yeah. cost, yeah, it's a charity, um, and helping them operationalize um, and basically turn their problem awareness into concrete action. Wow, that's and how have you seen that evolving then since you started to implement it? Like, yeah. So we, we've implemented it with all of our new investments ever since. We mm -hmm. simply said to entrepreneurs, if you are not willing to adopt this, yeah. then we are not interested in doing business with you. Okay. We only want to be shareholders in companies that have this minimum commitment towards uh, society and environment. Mm -hmm. And then for our existing portfolio companies, um, we cannot implement it on our own. We are one shareholder. We're not 100% shareholder. Yeah? Mm -hmm. uh, typically, we're a minority shareholder. So we need to lobby for it and need to yeah. win other board members and also the management and founders in order to implement retroactively. And that is not finished process. We're talking about 60 companies. Um, but uh, as of today, about a third of the companies have already implemented. Mm -hmm. And with the others, it's on the way. Uh, for yeah. some, it took only weeks. For others, it will take quarters, mm -hmm. but we're getting there and we yeah. are very convicted. Yeah. We're leading by example. Um, so my next question, um, young people are undoubtedly the future of climate action. And what advice would you give to them? Say they have an innovative idea which they want to get investment in. Where would you recommend that they start? Yeah, <clears throat> so I think... Um, First of all, it's very important to basically un really understand the nature of the business idea or, or product idea that you have. Mm -hmm. And um, not every business or only a certain fraction of, of businesses that are founded out there are actually by their DNA suitable for venture capital funding mm -hmm. because it's only those that are in its nature targeting very very large markets billion dollar markets and that are founded with the um, ambition of basically going through the whole venture capital um, life cycle up until trade sale or ipo eight to ten years after foundation mm -hmm. with all the pros and cons that come with it mm -hmm. yeah? and um, and that only applies for a fraction of what we see in entrepreneurial activity in the climate tech area in a broader sense. So many of those businesses are also um, closer from their DNA to what we call lifestyle businesses. So companies, uh, recently the, the term zebra was coined for it as opposed to unicorn companies or aspiring unicorns. <laughs> companies 
that are designed um, not to be do, to uh, to to make billion dollar revenues at some point at billion dollar valuations, but that are designed to be run and owned um, even 100% by their founders over a long time. Um, kind of a, you know a modern version of what we call Mittelstand in Germany, yeah? and that neither need VC financing because they operate and grow much closer to their cash flows, yeah, mm -hmm. and still um, can uh, reach meaningful size and even more meaningful impact uh, because there is basically no um, um, interference with third-party shareholder interests and less complexity. So really. Um, it's about, um, I think, you know, being realistic about what the DNA of your company is and what route you want to take. Yeah? Mm -hmm. VC funded high growth versus, um, um, yeah, as I said, lifestyle business um, owned and operated by its founders um, for for a long time. Um, I think that's an important distinction. Yeah, so not everything fits VC, and there's different, um, or, or say, the right fitting instruments for financing different types of businesses at, at different stages. Mm -hmm. okay, thank you. Um, and I think this is my final question, um, depending on our time wise. Mm -hmm. um, but research has shown that women often perceive and act on a more collectivist basis um, at times than their male counterparts. Um, and this has also been shown to be beneficial when it comes to tackling climate action. So I just wanted to know what place you see women as having within climate tech and climate action investment. Yeah, so I, I, I generally agree with uh, with your notion. Yeah. And um, we are, so out of the, since we started, basically since we started the climate tech practice at Early Bird about, uh, almost about 12 months ago, we saw more than 400 investment opportunities from this sector, mm -hmm. which we, which we subcategorized by certain industry and technology focus areas. We wrote a blog post on Early Bird Medium if you're interested uh, on the details. Um, and we saw a higher than, than average um, um, share of women on the founder teams mm -hmm. and we also look closely um, at several of those deals uh, for example also recently here from berlin including planetly yeah. at Anna alex um, uh, whom i first met at zalando in in 2008 mm -hmm. <laughs> um, uh, that Anna alex has co-founded with with two male co-founders and um, we um, we are uh, yeah, very we are doing everything we can including female entrepreneurship events including hosting also women in tech and women in VC events here at our early bird office. We are doing everything to encourage and promote female involvement to a stronger extent than in the past. Um, and we think climate tech um, or generally ESG related uh, matters um, statistically um, should seem to be more prone of attracting female entrepreneurial talent than some other sectors are, which we appreciate and we really um, keep our fingers crossed. And hopefully soon we will um, be able to invest in the first women-led uh, climate tech deal. Amazing. That's, yeah, that sounds all very great. Um, um, I think we do have a bit of time left. So um, one of the other questions that I had in mind to ask you about was, um, do you have any plans to, at the moment, from what I understand, your investment is quite European based um, and uh, with the climate crisis being, uh, having the greatest impact in many ways on the global south, do you have any plans for the future to spread your the investment uh, based further um, out to kind of the global south? Yeah, that's a difficult one um, mm. because um, at Early Bird, you know, now being 23 years in the market, um, we have once burned our fingers badly um, yeah. with a U.S. investment strategy in the early 2000 years. We lost almost entirely our money okay. and that made us pull back um, for good and um, it made us um, basically commit to investing all across Europe where today with a team of 45 people we count amongst the three largest firm, firms in early stage investing by headcount across Europe um, and um, made us realize that early stage investing is largely driven by proximity to the local ecosystems and also the value add that you can deliver to the entrepreneurs and the companies um, you, are, um, you are on the board with largely depend in the early stages on the geographical um, and ecosystem proximity. Mm -hmm. And therefore, um, we will stick from an investment perspective, we will stick to Europe. 
for the time being. No US, no China, and also no Global South or, or Africa, for example. Okay. Um, however, as part of our um, firm-wide effort that has by now even been engraved into our company culture, um, with regards to promoting ESG goals, w not only with our climate tech practice, uh, we have initiated uh, the Early Bird Vision Lab, which is basically an accelerator program, six months accelerator program targeted at refugees from the global south that came uh, in the first place now to Germany and where we want um, um, with, a, a, with a, um, a set of partners, including Google for Startups and Bain Company and some media partners, where we want to um, support these refugees in building own entrepreneurial careers and being integrated into the entrepreneurial ecosystem and getting access to that, yeah. which they statistically basically do not have. Yeah. This is a pro bono effort where also um, early bird uh, partners um, are committing private capital to in order um, to, to promote entrepreneurial activity from the global south. Oh, wow. That's really interesting. What's the, is it a, so it's a scheme? It, it's an accelerator program, um, and we are right now putting this um, together and have on, on board the partners that I just mentioned, and uh, bearing part of the financial load of it, um, mm -hmm. which is close to 1 million euros, bearing part of that privately ourselves from the Early Bird Partnership and currently talking to a couple of, um, say, philanthropic um, corporates, but also um, uh, successful entrepreneurs and uh, entrepreneurial families in order to join us and then um, uh, uh, hopefully kicking this off uh, in the next one or two quarters operationally. Uh, that's... Hi, guys. <laughs> Sorry to jump on that amazing discussion there. Mm -hmm. um, we're running out of time. So I want to thank, uh, first of all, Fabian for sharing his vision with us today and um, Laura for, for sharing your great questions with us today. Um, we really appreciate you being there. Um, so... Please join the event chat if you have some more time mm -hmm. um, and you may leave the stage. Thank you, Thank guys. You. Thank you, Fabian. It's been Thank great you. talking to you. Thank you, Laura. Bye. Okay, so we have concluded our first part of our summit. Thank you very much for sticking with us. Um, please do not leave. Um, next up, we have opened the networking um, experience, which you can see on the left-hand side of the screen. We have that open for the next 15 minutes. Please feel free to use the function um, if you wish, or you can discuss with people on the event chat. And don't forget, you can also chat in private in the people tab. So please click on the name of the person you would like to chat to and initiate a private discussion if you wish. Also, please do not forget um, to go to our polls. If you've seen our polls today, have you answered those? Um, we will be collecting all the responses after the summit and we're really excited to see um, what you have to say. Coming up at um, 6.20, we have the stage um, with the next um, batch of speakers. We're going to be hearing updates from Aidan McLean at UFO Drive, um, Hannah Helper at Wright Based in Science, Lawrence Kemble Cook at Pavagen, and finally Lauren Han from Sono Motors. So a lot of electric car coming up as well. Um, so thank you very much, guys. Please stick with us. I know it's sunny, but it will be great. Um, networking starts at 6.05 CET and I will see you back on the stage in approximately 15 minutes from now. Thank you very much, guys, and I will see you soon. <laughs>